We will be entering a new year, a new day, year 2020. So what comes to your mind when we say 2020? Yeah? Ah, oh, it is the perfect vision, the perfect visual equity um, as per the Snellen's chart. It is the clarity and the sharpness of vision. And I've read some prophecy, which is, I think it's ridiculous, that 2020, they said, it's the year that Jesus Christ will come. It's, the, the author even said May 2020, but you know, we know that nobody knows the hour when our Lord is coming, isn't it? But I pray that the coming year, 2020, that it will be a productive year for all of us as we fulfill our individual vision and the vision of this church, which is to know God intimately, to connect with people intentionally, and to proclaim the gospel boldly. As you know, the world is in its final hours. Do you agree? With the signs, the signs are there with the calamities like recently, the uh, storm surge, flash floods in the Philippines, the earthquakes, the bushfires. You know, all these calamities that weren't there before. Like the intensity is more. We had that before, but it's not as intense. So, and also with the um, wars, the conflicts are there between nations, then we can really say that it is the final hours. And it can make us fearful to step into what's ahead. But how many of you know that the church also is in its finest hours? Do you agree? Do you agree? Because nowadays we can see prophecies being fulfilled before our very eyes. The prophecies in the Bible, it's being fulfilled right now. And supernatural occurrences are happening. So we can say that God is really up to something. And don't you want to be a part of it? I want to be a part of it. And I want this church to be a part of the move of God. Let us not watch from the sidelines. Let us not just spectators. We can be a part of the move of God if we know our purpose. So let us be a people, a church, who knows our mission and our purpose in life. And that main purpose in this life is to live in freedom and to glorify God. There are so many things that we can say our purpose is, but to just generalize it, is our purpose here is to live with freedom and to glorify God. That's what Jesus came here for. He died to give us freedom, not only freedom with him in eternity, but while we are still here on earth and to glorify our Father. Jesus had a purpose, and as followers of Jesus, that should be our purpose as well. But the sad thing for us Christians is when we live our lives not realizing our purpose. Because do you know that the devil is not afraid of you living, but he is afraid of you living with your purpose, living out your purpose. Church, we have an eternity to live with God, but only a lifetime to live for him. So let's make our lives count on this side of eternity. So before the year ends, for next year, why don't we give our best for him? Amen? Amen. But we know that to live in freedom, there are obstacles and challenges that are thrown our way to stop us from living a victorious life. But know this, that every obstacle before you is there to strengthen you for the calling and the purpose of God in your life. Because what the devil meant for evil, God can turn it for our good. We always hear that. So in James 1, the title of the message is The Art of War, by the way. I don't, I don't know what to title it. It's just like, just came. It's not the book. I don't know if you've read the book. If General is here, I'm sure he has read it. 
It's in James 1, 2. So it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So what you're dealing with right now is meant to develop you. That's why if you are struggling right now, you can't run away from it because the outcome, if you persevere, it says in the word of God, you may be mature, complete, and not lacking anything. So don't be complacent about your life. My dear brothers and sisters, it is a battle. It is a battle. God has called us to step into the fight because victory is already assured. On the cross, our victory is already assured. But while we're here, here on earth, we continue fighting. Okay? But you may say, you're good. You're not struggling with anything. You are in a happy place right now. You might say that. But we, the battle still continues. Because if you're not fighting for yourself, God is calling you to fight for somebody else. So don't sit back because somebody you might know might be battling with something. Maybe you need to step outside of yourself and get involved with a fight for somebody or stand alongside somebody so that they too will live in freedom. So just a quick note of the enemies of freedom. It, I think it was mentioned with a previous preaching about the civil war and everything before. Like one of the enemies of the freedom is ourselves. Like insecurities, unforgiveness, guilt, shame, rejection. And the bigger enemy, the giants in our lives, the fears of any kind, addiction of any kind, financial worries, chronic illness, relationship problems. But behind it all, the biggest enemy, the enemy of our souls, the devil, the lion, our adversary. In 1 Peter 5.8, it says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. So the lion, he is described as a roaring lion. We all have different issues and challenges that we need to conquer. But today, I would like to focus on how to attack the enemy of our souls or the art of war, so that we can live in freedom and victory. To do that, I want to show you an obscure character in the Bible who exemplify, exemplified how he defeated his enemies. His name was Benaya. I don't know if you've heard about him. He is an obscure character, but he was mentioned in three books of the Bible, just a very short uh, note in um, Samuel, in Kings, and in Chronicles. He was part of, he was one of David's mighty men. He was part of the 30. You know David, he had uh, three mighty men, but he also had 30 that, you know, protects him. It's like the presidential, the PSG in the Philippines, you know, the presidential security group. They are the, uh, the people who, who were handpicked by the president or by the highest in the military to protect the president. So they are, we know that they are courageous, that they are really uh, best, the best in the military. So Benaya was one of those. So let us focus on First Chronicles, which is the text of this message. 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verses 22 to 25. And out of this story, I hope we can learn something and apply it to our lives as we face the year 2020. So let's read 1 Chronicles 11, 22 to 25. There was also Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant warrior from Kabzil. He did many heroic deeds which included killing two champions. In other translations, it says two lion-like uh, men in Moab. 
Another time, on a snowy day, he chased a lion down into a pit and killed it. Once, armed only with a club, he killed an Egyptian warrior who was seven and a half feet tall. I think he's a giant. I don't know, uh, Goliath? I don't know how tall he was, Goliath. But this Egyptian warrior was seven and a half feet tall, and who was armed with a spear as thick as a weaver's beam, like a probably a, a flagpole or something. Benaya wrenched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with it. Deeds like this made Benaya as famous as the three mightiest warriors. He was more honored than the other members of the thirty, though he was not one of the three. And David made him captain of his bodyguard. And also, I read that he also, Solomon, when David died, he was also made the captain of the bodyguard of Solomon. So, what are the observations that we can see from these verses? First, Benaiah was a warrior. It says there he, he did many heroic deeds. So we can say that he was courageous. And he had the DNA of a warrior because it says there again that his father, Jehoiada, was a valiant warrior. Do you know that we are also warriors in God's kingdom? In Exodus 15:3, when the children of Israel were singing the song of deliverance from the Egyptians, in Exodus 15:3 it says, "Our God is a warrior." It says there, "Jehovah is his name." Hence as children, we also have the DNA of a warrior. In 2 Timothy 1:7, I'm sure you know this verse. It says, "God has not given us a spirit of fear." but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Traits of a warrior. Power, sa power love, and self-discipline in other translations. I remember when I was young in Sunday school, we used to, there's a, a song that I really like because the, the actions were really good. Like, I don't know if you know this one, but it says... Uh, I may, I may never march in the infantry, ride on the cavalry, shoot with artillery. I may never march in the infantry, but I'm in the Lord's army. I'm in the Lord's army. I think some of you are nodding. Yeah, it was one of my favorite songs when I was in Sunday school. So it says, we are the Lord's army. So we are warriors. And also the famous hymn. Famous uh, sung by the Salvation Army. I think they are most famous in singing this. Onward, Christian soldiers. Do you know that hymn? Yes. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching us to war. So, my dear, my dear friends, we are in a battle. We are in a war. So, first, Benaya was a warrior. Second observation, Benaya was a lion chaser and a giant slayer. Because in verse 22, it says, Another time on a snowy day, he chased a lion down into a pit and killed it. Once armed only with a club, he killed an Egyptian who was seven and a half feet tall. We read that one before. So Benaiah didn't kill the lion out of self-defense. Benaiah went after the lion before the lion went after him. He chased the lion. The natural tendency for many of us is to flee or to run for our dear lives when we are confronted with a lion, isn't it? If you go to a safari and then the lion is coming towards you, what is the response? Isn't it the, the stress response? Flight? <laughs> the flight response. We, we will be running for our dear lives. But Benaya, according to this verse, he was proactive. He chased the lion before the lion even went after him. So let us, let us just picture the scenario. Maybe one day he was walking around the outskirts of his village or in the field, and he saw a lion that maybe could eventually hurt him or eventually hurt people around him or maybe can eventually hurt families 
in that village. So he said this, before the lion can attack us and kill us, I want to go and chase it and fight it and kill it. But many of us today are doing the opposite. Because when it hurts me, that's the time I'll deal with it. When it affects me, then that's the time I will kill it. When it passes the line, I'll deal with it. But if it hasn't passed the line yet, I'll wait. If it's not an addiction yet, it's okay. If it's not an affair yet, I'm okay. If it's not a full-blown illness yet, I don't have to do something for my life. He or she hasn't confronted me yet. Or he or she hasn't asked forgiveness yet. I'll wait, even when bitterness starts to creep inside of me. It's just a little gossip, so it's okay. My kids haven't said anything or complained, so I guess they're okay. So I'll keep working like crazy. And before you know it, it's already a problem. I love what Benaya did. Benaya said, it's not a problem yet, but tomorrow it might be. So before it becomes a problem, I will kill it. Before it can harm somebody close to me, I will take it first. Before it can attack me or it can attack my family, I will come close and I will kill it. I will not wait for it to come close. He didn't wait for it to destroy his family. Binaya said, I've looked at you and I know you're kind. You're not here for me. You are here to take me out. You are here to steal, kill, and destroy. Because in John 10, 10, it says, the thief's purpose is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So before you get me and somebody close to me, Binaya was probably saying, I'm going to chase you and get you first. So what is it? for us today maybe today you are struggling maybe you are walking through something maybe you are on the edge of bitterness addiction of any kind including social media by the way maybe you are in the edge of throwing in the towel and says I've had enough maybe you're on the edge of sin maybe your family is on the brink of chaos but it's not there yet. I wonder this morning that before we leave this place or before we face the new year, we can deal with this lion. We can kill it before it can affect you and others. Because know this, no bad decision only affects you. It also affects people around you. Every time you step out of your purpose, every time you do something selfish, and not deal with a lion or the lions in your life, it is not just your life that gets affected. It can affect your family, your friends, your workplace, and even your church. But the opposite is also true, because every giant you defeat, every work of the devil you take down, every insecurity, every self-pity, every anger, every rejection, every betrayal you've overcome, every fear that you got away from doesn't only affect you, but it also affects everybody else around you. How? Because the breakthrough that you've experienced can be your ministry. So it's not wasted, you know? The things that we go through and we've overcome, the Lord has given us a breakthrough, it's not a waste, even if, even if at that time there was so much pain, because it can be your ministry. You can grab somebody else's hand, and you can walk them through that and say, I've been through it, so I can walk you through it. I've been there. I've killed it. I've done that. I've killed the giant, so I can walk you through that giant that you are struggling with now. So today, it's either you let it go or you do something about it before it becomes a problem. Be proactive like Benaya. Chase that lion. 
before it can chase you. The church should not be on defense. The problem with us sometimes is we are a reactionary, we have a reactionary Christianity. We don't do something, and before we know it, there's a problem, and then we react, isn't it? We shouldn't be a reactionary Christian. What is a reactionary Christian? When every, every, every time something creeps up, we react. Or we make decisions out of fear and not out of faith. We listen to the negative voices instead of listening to the God who is the God of all possibilities. Amen. So, we should continue to keep taking ground, keep pushing against the works of darkness in Jesus' name. We're going to keep advancing. We're going to push the devil back. So as soon as he tries, he is already taken aback. Okay? Because sometimes it starts as a little thing, but if you nip it on the bud, it will not, it will not become big. So we must be proactive, church, about that. And another observation is, in order to kill the lion, Binaya had to create a pit or a space for the battle that only one can come out from. A place where he knew he can defeat the lion, or the lion can defeat him, actually. It is a place that the lion cannot escape, or he cannot escape. So it's like now or never situation. Benaya was saying, I will chase the thing before it attacks me, and I will create a space where I have to deal with this thing once and for all so that it ends here. Church, we too can create a pit, a space where we can be honest with ourselves and take inventory of the things that we have to let go or to even kill so that we will not be bringing it to the next year. We will not wait and procrastinate any longer. We are going to deal with our issues, our giants, the lions in our lives, and it should end here in this pit, like what Benaya did. Enough of the torment devil, enough of the fear, enough of the lies and intimidation, enough of the complacency, it should end here. Benaya was focused. He knew his purpose. He knew his goal. And he made a strategy on how he can defeat his enemy. I have a, um, I just want to share this from my heart. This year has been a bit difficult for our family. It's like one concern rises up and when it's dealt with or resolved, another thing creeps up. But it's not only concerning our family, but also concerning some issues that people in the church go through. And as leaders, we have to deal with it. So there was a time when I was too exhausted and I was too tired. And one day, I was driving, I was tired and exhausted, and I was praying to God about all these issues. Then the next thing I know, something rises up within me. I was reminded, I was playing a worship song, and I was reminded that our God is a powerful God, that he has no rival, that he has no equal, that he is the lion of Judah, the greatest of all lions. And something rises up within me because um, I was praying, I was shouting actually, I was rebuking the devil. I was telling him, you are powerless. I'm tired of you, like, you know, making me run down with all these uh, emotions. So I was praying with my tears running down my cheeks. And I was declaring, praising, and proclaiming that the, our God is more powerful than the devil. And you know what? Something shifted. Something shifted that time. The problems were still there. But there was a sense of peace that everything will be dealt with by the Lord. And that is freedom, by the way. 
Because it's not denial of what we are going through. It's the peace that, is, that settles within us that no matter what, we have the commander of the heaven's armies with us. We were saying about that. We were singing about that a while ago. And what Pastor Roslin was saying uh, two Sundays ago, that we have angels around us. They are also ready to fight for us. So uh, just a brief story. After Pastor Roslin gave that message, um, Ina and Josh had an accident. And it was, the, it, was a, it was not a small accident because the car was really um, crushed. And it's still in the uh, mechanic at the moment. Right after that, that service, you know, when they were like, it wasn't their fault. But praise the Lord, not, no one was hurt. Even the person who um, crashed into their car, no one was hurt. And uh, when they were like talking with this woman, who, like they were all calm. Both of them were calm as well. And they were saying, you know, because the message this morning is that we have angels that are protecting us. And, that, and they were sharing it to the person who like crashed into them. So the person even said, you are leaving what you believe, you know, and it's a great testimony. So we shouldn't fear because we have angels around us as well to fight in our battles. And our freedom is our, our inheritance as a child of God. So whenever you are confronted with something, create a space, a pit, where you can defeat the enemy. So if there are things that you need to get right now, to get right with God right now, do it now. That pit, it's only one person who can come out. And it should be you and not the enemy. Amen? So the next observation is Benaya had a strategy. I keep on telling this one. He chose a snowy day to chase the lion, made him fall into a pit and killed him. How many of you have experienced the snow? Yeah? Those who came from UK? Yeah? You know that the snow is not the best condition to fight, isn't it? There is lack of traction and there it's, the ground is slippery. So why did Benaya chose a snowy day to kill the lion? Because it was a strategy. He knows that for him... For him himself, it is not the best condition to fight. But maybe he thought that it was not only him who will find it difficult, but the lion as well. Because as you know, lions usually stay and thrive in warm areas. They usually hide in the bushes and waiting for their prey, and they attack by surprise. So fighting on a snowy day is an uncharted and an unfamiliar territory for lions. So, like Benaya, we will find situations where we have to deal with the attacks of the enemy when we are also in a difficult circumstances or situations when it is not ideal for us. Because Satan, our enemy, attacks his hardest when you have a tough time or when you are exhausted. So, remember this. Satan attacks his hardest when you have a tough time or when you are exhausted. Mothers, I think this is, um, we should remember this. Because sometimes we are exhausted, or not only mothers, parents. We are exhausted and because of our exhaustion, we can say something that we don't mean to, like to our children. So, and that's the ploy of Satan. He can attack us when we are exhausted. This is one of his schemes. That's why we should be sober and be vigilant. Being sober means we stay in control of ourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit. But you know what? We can bring the enemy to a place where it is unfamiliar to him. Where it is not his territory. And one of these places is what we call worship. Yes, we might be in a place where everything is not right within us 
it is a snowy day for us as well. And we are wrestling with our enemy, that lion who is roaring and waiting to devour us. But that is the best time to fight. The enemy might, the enemy might be saying, gotcha, got you. He may be thinking that he has the upper hand because you woke up with a bad attitude. You are stressed, you're irritable, and all hell is about to break loose. But little did he know that the grace of God is sufficient. For when we are weak, our God, the commander of heaven's armies, is strong. So take your worst into worship where the devil cannot operate. Take your worst by giving, by thanksgiving, by persevering, by forgiving. The devil doesn't care if you mope around. He likes that. He can follow you there where you have self-pity. That's what he likes. But the place he cannot follow you is worship. Every time you give a faith offering, when you don't have much, he cannot even touch it. Every time you forgive, he crumbles. Every time you pray, he trembles in fear. Don't fight fair with the devil because he doesn't fight fair with you. You have to have a jump start. The devil is out to get your kids, so pray for them. He's going to try to get your marriage, so pray for your spouse. He wants to destroy the unity of the church, so pray for your brothers and sisters who have offended you. If there are things you need to get right with God, do it now. Do it even when it's a snowy day for you, because the devil also cannot take, cannot um, follow you there. Praise, worship, thanksgiving, generosity, forgiveness. That is, God wants us to live in freedom. That's why we have to do it. Son 2, in the art of war, this is the book. He, he is not a Christian, by the way. But I like, I like, Rujun, I think, wrote, read this book, The Art of War. Son 2 said, if you know the enemy, and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. In 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11, it says, So that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar, we are not ignorant of his schemes. So you know the enemy, you know the enemy. We are not ignorant of his schemes. And you know yourself, you are the child of God. And you can only be a child of God if you acknowledge Jesus' work on the cross and receive him as your personal Savior. And through the name of Jesus Christ, we have given all power over evil spirits. We have God's authority over the enemy. And you have the armor of God at your disposal. So fear not. For 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he that is in you that he, than he that is in the world. And lastly, Benaya was a lion chaser. We should be a lion chaser. But most of all, we should be a God chaser. God wants us to be free. If there is anything that prevents us from living victoriously, God wants that stronghold to be broken. Because the aim of our freedom is not only for ourselves, it's not for ourselves, but to give him glory. Jesus wants to take down our giants so we can walk free and have the life that he wants us to live. And he wants to do so so that his name can be exalted above every other name in our world. It is so people around us look at our lives and say, your God is truly God. And they will be attracted to come to the kingdom of God. Because if you are living a defeated life, even if you are Christians, you know, we profess to be Christians, and every little thing will keep, make us uh, defeat, be, feel defeated, what will... What will attract, you know, other people if they can see the victory in your life? So 
we should be living victorious lives because it is for the glory of God so that they will be attracted to come to the kingdom of God. So our freedom and God's glory are woven together. Jesus gave his life on the cross to set us free. Can I ask the worship team, please? He also gave his life on the cross to glorify God. That was his purpose. Now we are to continue that mission and purpose so that we can build the kingdom of God. To continue the work of Jesus to bring back lost souls to the family of God. But it should start with us individually and as a church to seek, to hunger, to chase the presence of God. You know, remember the Israelites? They always have the Ark of the Covenant whenever they go to war. They always have the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God. And remember Moses when he said in Exodus 33, 15, If your presence will not go with me, we will not go up. We will not, we will not, we will not proceed with what we are going to if your presence will not go with us. So church, we should also chase the presence of God so that we will be equipped for the battle ahead. We are weak without the presence of God because only in His presence that we have the power to defeat the enemy and be victorious in our Christian life. If God is for us and in us, who can be against us? My dear brothers and sisters, it is the final hours, but it is also the finest hours to be alive. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching us to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. God bless us all. Amen.